Good morning, everybody. For our children, you have your Sunday school up in the gym. So I think they're uh, already there, right? Our children. They're already in our Sunday school. So if you have your Bible, today we'll be in the book of Ruth, chapter 2. So uh, you can open your Bible there. I also have some of the verses in here on the PowerPoint. Um, but let me open with a word of prayer as we uh, begin. Let's invite God to speak to us so that today is not just another Sunday. But it's a Sunday that God speaks to us personally. Let's pray. Father, speak to us in the person of the uh, third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Convict us of our sins. Convince us of our needs of Jesus, a Redeemer. And uh, change our lives according to your purpose and glory. Holy Spirit, uh, we allow you to do that today. From the bottom of our hearts, we thank you in advance for what you will do. Not only in our lives, but in the lives of our loved ones. The circumstances of uh, our week and uh, everyone that is uh, close to us. So thank you, Lord Jesus. We honor you. And we lift your name. No other name in this place will be lifted up. Only the name of Jesus. Because it is in the powerful name of Jesus I pray. Amen. So we are on a series called Redeemer. Uh, like to have the word Redeemer as a person. So uh, you know that's a person, right? And eventually this series will take us to uh, Jesus Christ. Who is actually the ultimate Redeemer. But in chapter 2. We see a person by the name of Boaz. He is what is called a kinsman redeemer. Because in their context and in their culture, according to the word of God, if there is a widow uh, who is um, needing somebody, uh, because a widow without anybody at all is really a, a bad situation. They will be in poverty. They will be ostracized. And so any relative whatsoever, like anyone in the clan who is a blood related can be a kinsman redeemer, someone to protect this person, to rescue this person. So it's already a preview of what Jesus Christ has done for us as a redeemer. So just a bit of a review, if you look at, uh, if you remember from the previous chapter, so chapter 1 of Ruth, we studied that uh, Ruth uh, and his family name Elimelech, which in our uh, language it means, my God, the king, that's the name Elimelech. He moved his family to uh, a place called Moab from uh, Bethlehem, the house of bread, because there was no bread, there was famine. He moved himself and his family to Moab, which is a place of uh, really uh, wicked place, evil and all these practicing idolatry. So he moves his family. In the process, his, uh, um, the Elimelech died and his two sons also named, remember the names of the sons? Melon. And Kilian. Yeah, that's the name. Melon and Kilian. They died too. So uh, last Sunday, uh, as Pastor Bin preached the rest of chapter 1, finally uh, with nobody in that place, uh, Naomi, that's the name, Naomi moved back to Bethlehem. And uh, along the way, her daughter-in-law, Ruth, Went with her. So this is where we are now. In uh, We're back in uh, Bethlehem now. In the house of bread. As Naomi moves back. And uh, Pastor Ben mentioned also. In verse 8 of uh, Ruth 1. Uh, Naomi said to uh, the daughters-in-law. Uh, that may the Lord show you kindness. And I believe the word kindness was explained. Uh, in the original word it means uh, hesed. H-E-S-E-D. And it really means it's like God's love wrapped in his faithfulness, mercy, loyalty, and grace. 
So the word uh, faith, uh, the word hesed there is actually, it involves a lot of things about what God does for us. It involves his love, his faithfulness, his mercy, his loyalty, his grace. And so today we will talk about this grace, receiving God's grace. Quickly, grace is an undeserved, unearned gift from God. I mean, that's probably a redundant, right? Like gift is, you don't, un it's unearned. You don't earn that, it's a gift. But that's what grace is. We need grace. We need the grace of God because we need that to get to heaven, to be close to God. Because we all are sinners. The Bible says we all have sinned and fallen short of God's expectation. So case in point, in the Old Testament, so we discussed that our Bible starts from the Old Testament, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. This is where we are. So this is what God instructed his people, which is us also. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord, your God, and do what is right, in his eyes, in God's eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the disease, diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. So I'm going through my personal reading the book of Exodus. I thought this is a, a fitting uh, context because underlying there it says, if you do what is right in God's eyes. And so then we move to the book of Judges. We know that it says, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So God says, if you do what is right in my eyes, I will not do this. I will bless you. But look at this. He actually, the people actually did what was right in their own eyes. And that's the context of the book of Ruth. That's uh, where we are. And so there is a need for us, even just in this simple example, there's a need for us for a redeemer. Someone to save us, to rescue us, because we are not perfect. Okay, so let me uh, share you a, a quick story about perfection. God, if you want to go to heaven without trusting in God, trusting in Jesus, uh, you have to be perfect. For example, okay, so this month, my goal was, I had a goal this month, to climb the grouse grind 10 times in the month of May. Well, guess what? I didn't make it. <laughs> I climbed 9 out of 10. Uh, but that's, that's no good. There are, yeah, <laughs> 9 out of 10. That's a fail. In the eyes of God. In our academic, it's 90%. That's pretty good, right? But then there are 10 commandments, right? In the Bible. It says in the book of James that if you fail on one, you fail all. Because God requires us to be perfect. So it is possible to uh, go to heaven, but you have to be perfect. And nobody is. And that's why we need a redeemer. We need Jesus to save us. And so the book of Ruth reminds us what this grace is all about. In fact, I have a quote here. Uh, it says that God's grace is amazing. He takes our lives, which are broken beyond repair, and he renews them with his loving kindness. You see, we need the grace of God because without his grace, remember grace is what he gives to us that we do not deserve, like his forgiveness, his mercy, salvation. That's the thing we don't deserve. He gives it to us, that's grace. But in the book of Ruth, we also find out how this grace not only saves us, but it actually continues as we are living in Christ. It continues to follow us. It's, uh, that's what we learn from this book of Ruth chapter 2. And in the lesson first, we'll learn how the grace of God works in our day-to-day -day life today. 
Number one, it reminds us that grace, God's grace works by directing us to favorable situations. So when you get to a situation in your life and you say, well, this is a nice one. It's a blessing from God. It is actually God's grace at work. Let me read uh, verses 1 to 3. It says, Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man upstanding from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As she turned out, she was working in the field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. So there was this guy who is a relative, possible a redeemer, someone who can help them, rescue them from poverty of being widows. And if you read, if you study the word uh, favor in here, that's the same word as the word grace. So Ruth was someone who do not deserve favor. Why? Because she was a Moabite. It tells you that God is not only a God for a certain people. God is a God for all peoples. Because look at this. This, this lady is not even from that place in Bethlehem. She was a Moabite. Moabite was a place that they don't worship God. And she moves with her mother-in-law and God's grace follows her. So she's like a new Christian experiencing the grace of God. And so despite her nationality, her past, despite who she was, she was looking for grace, for favor, and she found it. So why is that? So the situation is like this. So in their context, in their culture, someone who are harvesting in the fields, those, uh, the widows can follow them. And whatever is left over, if there's like one, you know, sticking around, they can cut it and they can keep it uh, for themselves. Why is that? Because God already prepared to support widows by the law in, in Deuteronomy 24, 19 to 22, and Leviticus 19. It says that uh, they need to be able to uh, harvest behind harvesters and see what leftovers. So I don't know if you, you know what I'm talking about. Some of young people who never experienced farming. Uh, can you imagine? You don't, you don't have imagination, right? Uh, but like, yeah, because it's hard to imagine when you don't know what like r rice planting and reaping, right? So there are things that are leftovers. You know, not everything you can, you know, harvest 100%. And so that's the job. God said, you know, allow the widows to do that. And so God already prepared that. But I like what happened here because it says, I'll show you. It says, as it turned out, she actually went to the field of Boaz. I like that phrase, as it turned out, because it tells us that from a human perspective, it looks like it was a coincidental. And it was like, Man, this is a, a coincidence that I happen to be in a place in the field of a possible kinsman redeemer named Boaz. So that's already God's favor. And so what? Just, just imagine this. Ruth was looking for a meal. You know what he found too? He found a man. <laughs> he was, she was looking for food. Guess what she found? A family. <laughs> because God's grace was already there, working through her. So the grace of God, remember, salvation, yeah, we receive that. That's a grace. But that same grace actually follows us. And so you can, you can call it whatever it is. If you need, like, healing, 
that's the same grace, healing grace, uh, forgiving grace. So it's the same grace. It's a gift from God. And so this, this Boaz was the type of the preview of Jesus Christ, the Redeemer. And this man happens to meet Ruth because Ruth happens to be, as it turned out, in his field. Now I can tell you that in the language and the vocabulary dictionary of God, there is no such thing as coincidence or accident. Because it's all in his favor and in his purpose that he can do this. Let me give you an example why there is no such thing as coincidence in the world, in, in the world of God. Check this out. Okay, so a few years ago, I took my car for an oil change. I mean, I live here in North Vancouver, right? Took my car, oil change to Vancouver to the house of Jane. It's not the bookstore in Abbotsford. It's like the house of James and Lucy's because he, he fixed his cars, right? So I was coming from North Van on Main Street. I turned left. I forgot the name of the, is it like 32, 33 on Main? 33, right? I turned left. So just imagine, like I was on this uh, Main Street turning left on 33 to James. So there was this light, uh, traffic light. I don't know if it was a crossing light only, crosswalk light, or an actual light. But anyway, as I turned left, there was a car turning right. And this car hit a girl. And I just happened to be there. And so right away, I said, I'm going to stop this driver from driving away because he might do that, and uh, we have no trace of him or anything like that. So anyway, I got out, and I said, that girl looks familiar from afar, because I was heading there to that spot. And uh, as it turned out, as, as this was said, as it turned out, guess who it was? <laughs> it was Apple, <laughs> our worship leader. <laughs> and so... We waited for an ambulance, and so the first responders came. And uh, so, as it turned out, by the way, even if you believe in coincidences or accident, whatever you call it, God can still use those coincidences into his purpose, right? So, but it's the same with uh, Ruth. She happens to be in the field of somebody who's supposed, who is qualified, a relative to save them, to redeem them, to help them. And so that's how grace works. Here's a second uh, reminder. Grace, God's grace works by protecting us even in difficult circumstances because listen to 8 to 9. So Boaz said to Ruth, so finally uh, Ruth met Boaz, the owner of the land. Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. Right away, because in their days, if you are a widow, for example, her, it's even worse for her because she's not only a widow, but she's a foreigner. And that's even more dangerous for her. But she happens to be, okay, the word happens to be in this field of Boaz, someone who is a relative. She didn't know. God led her there. And this man is protecting her, helping her. So he is already telling his man, if you keep reading here, he says to his man, you know, uh, don't touch her. Once you have all these uh, grain, take out a few of them and leave them for her on the, on the path. That's what he did. And so that's how God's grace works. Uh, the, the, the grace of God works. It's even in difficult circumstances, God is there. 
Why is it grace? Because we still don't deserve it. Like you say, Lord, I deserve that you protect me today. I deserve that you rescue me today. It doesn't sound right because we don't deserve it. And so God's grace works. So uh, one time I was, I was so aware, like sometimes we're not sure, we're not aware that God is actually protecting us. Uh, one time I was walking in this dark place. I, like I grew up in a place called Bisaris Kapookan Leyte. You guys know where it is? If, you, if anybody here knows where it is, good for you. It's, it's a small town. I grew up in this place, and uh, this place can be dangerous. I mean, uh, it's not uh, every day that you have uh, people being cut off into the main highway because they have uh, injuries from, uh, you know, hacks and all that stuff. That's, that's the place. But uh, as I was walking one day, um, I wasn't aware that during that time, there was actually somebody trying to, uh, to hurt somebody. But they came in after I passed. So things like that, right? Like you, you realize that, yeah, you know what? That's how God works. It's like we take it for granted that we are safe, but once we find out, it's actually, it's actually uh, the, the grace of God protecting us. And so it's the same thing with Ruth. Now, when you read uh, verse 14, you know that Ruth found favor in Boaz. Yeah, because it says there that Boaz started to uh, say to Ruth, you know, take a break. Uh, have a meal with me if you like. Uh, you can dip this bread into uh, this vinegar. Have you, have you ever had that, you know, this bread? Usually they have it in, like, good restaurants, sometimes in, uh, in Rome, Italy, or, but even in here, they give you bread, and they give you, like, olive oil, right, and then you put a vinegar, because in their culture, they don't just eat the bread, they have to dip it into something, it could be a soup, it could be vinegar, that's the way they eat, uh, so, by the way, by inviting uh, Ruth, Boaz is actually, that's like an intimate me meal already, and so, in other words, she found favor with him. And because technically, he needs to marry her by law to be able to rescue her. That's how they, they work. So, if, but if he doesn't like her, what can you do? Right? So, but uh, that's his job, to rescue them from poverty. And so, yeah, he, uh, that's what he said. So, in other words, even after... Ruth was gone. He was actually working on the background to protect her. Because she didn't know that he instructed the workers to do certain things, a certain favor for her. So that's how God works in our lives too. God is working to protect us, but sometimes we, we are not aware of it, but you know that God is doing that. So Ruth has no worries, no problem. He, she was not hungry. And if you look at the, uh, the text, she comes home uh, with food. And they have a different measurement, but if you calculate that to our uh, days, it's like 30 pounds. She was able to bring home food for 30, uh, 30 pounds. Good for, uh, for, for them, but for some of us, maybe for a day only. <laughs> if you eat a lot. So that's how God, the grace of God works. Here's the last reminder from this text. The grace of God works. The reason why we experience the grace of God is so that when we are blessed, by blessing us to be a testimony of his grace, he gives us blessings so he can bless other people too. Listen to verses 17. To 19. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley and she had gathered and it amounted to about an epa, which is about 30 pounds. That's the, uh, that's the weight in our time. She carried it back to town and her mother-in-law saw uh, how much she had 
gathered, Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. Her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Because even her mother-in-law didn't know where she went. Where did you work? Blessed is the man, blessed is the man who took notice of you. And if you continue reading, then they're praising God because of his provision. So, she had grain. Not only that, but also good news. Because the man really liked her. Which was very important for the future love and marriage. Which is what they, uh, what they need to do. So, just remember when God, when you receive God's blessing, it's not only for you. It's supposed to overflow to other people. What blessings do you have that you can share? Is it the salvation that you have from Christ? Yeah, you need to share that too. Is it the forgiveness you receive from Christ? Yes, you need to share that too. Actually, Rick Warren, in his quote, he says this. Grace isn't just God's part. It's also our part. Grace requires you to forgive people who hurt you. It requires you to reach out and give people second chances. In other words, God's blessing to us is a testimony of his grace and it needs to be passed down to other people also. So God's blessing to Boaz flowed to Ruth and to Naomi. So the women needed a redeemer. And they received that in Boaz. And if you didn't have a redeemer, you know who he is. Jesus Christ is someone you need. Because if you are not, if you don't have a redeemer, it, the Bible reminds us that you are spiritually poor. That's not my word. That's the word of God. You need someone to save you, and Jesus Christ died for you. Without Jesus, the word of God says that you are in spiritual poverty. So let me uh, close this session, this message, with this reminder. Your difficult circumstance is God's opportunity to craft the testimony of his grace in your life. Because out of your testing will come your testimony of God's amazing grace. You know, we are in that season now in our life with uh, Nina's help. It's like really difficult, this uh, testing. But we are expecting a, a good story, a good testimony to come out of that. And maybe right now your life is good, like you don't have any health problems, you, you're making a lot of money, share. <laughs> you're traveling a lot. Uh, but when times are difficult for you, just remember that these are God's opportunities for us, for you to craft the testimony of his amazing grace in your life. It's hard to have God's testimony when life is good. It's really do. It's like if you're just having fun, enjoying the world. I mean, you should do that. You should travel if you have the money. Don't borrow. Only if you have the money. You should enjoy that. But when life is tough, that's when God crafts this story in your life so you can share it to others also. So don't say, God, why are you testing me? And so we find ourselves, my family and Nina and I, are in that testing of life, but we are excited for the testimony that God's amazing grace will come. And so in our closing, number two is very important, repent from your sins or of your sins and receive God's grace of salvation today. I think that's very important for us. The reason why we do number two is to receive the grace of God.
This is the word of God. Let's pray together. Let me uh, call the worship team as well. So let's uh, close our eyes and let's pray. But before I pray, I just want to offer this prayer of salvation for you to trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and to receive the grace of God. If you have not done that in your life, I'm going to give you this opportunity to receive the grace of God. And this grace of God, it covers a lot of things, but it begins with salvation. It begins with relationship with God through Jesus. And then his grace follows you in your life. Whether in tough times, in good times, in testings, his grace is there. So if you want to pray a prayer of salvation, receiving Jesus, pray this prayer. God knows your heart and your mind. I am only leading you to uh, this prayer, but it is your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for your grace. I ask for your forgiveness for my sins. And I want to receive you, Lord Jesus, as my Savior and my Lord. So I can have a relationship with God. And I can have this grace that saves me from my sins. And that I have eternal life also when I die. And that this grace will sustain me in difficult times. So I receive this gift of grace from you. And as your word reminds us, this grace is sealed with a promise in the presence of the Holy Spirit living in me. So I know now I am a child of yours. And I give you my life. I surrender my life to you, Lord Jesus. You are my Lord and my Savior. If you pray that prayer, welcome to the family of God. You are a child of God. You are a born-again believer of Jesus. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your word today. That your grace is always, always, always enough for us. No matter the circumstance we go through, your grace is always enough. And so we thank you for the blessing that we can bless others also. And that's, again, in good times or in bad times. We thank you so much in Christ's name.